If you really pause to think about it, it really is stunning that year after year, we gather on a night like this. On the night of Good Friday, the worst of days, a day that had we been standing in that moment, had we been there on that Friday, all of us would agree from the religious to the non-religious, uh, from the certain to the skeptic, to the Jesus people and the people who didn't have a people. All of us would agree in this moment that this man taught great things. This man claimed a great power. He touched like no one else touched. He did what no one else would do. But yet, he was crushed, bruised, humiliated, stripped, and crucified. The worst of deaths. It's not an instant death. It's not quick. It's not humane. It's brutal. It's long. Crucifixion was invented and created by the Persians. It was adapted by Alexander the Great, passed down to the Carthaginians, perfected by the Romans. Jewish historian Josephus called the crucifixion the most wretched of deaths. Roman philosopher Cicero forbade even the thought of crucifixion. This method of execution was so agonizing that a word was invented just to describe it. The word excruciating describes crucifixion. Literally, the word excruciating means from the cross. Jesus, after a series of false trials, had a crudely fashioned crown of thorns forcefully shunted down onto his scalp and then was given a cross to carry on his exposed and abused back on the road to his execution. This 650-yard walk, this road that he walked on was called the Via Dolorosa, the way of suffering. It would have most likely been lined by people who were ready to mock and insult and spit at Jesus as he limped toward Golgotha. Unable to make the, the journey on his own, Jesus collapsed under the weight of the cross, likely bruising his heart and all the cardiac muscles around. Thankfully, Simon of Cyrene was appointed to help Jesus carry this cross the remainder of the way. Upon arriving at the scene of his execution, Jesus' beard would have been plucked, the ultimate act of shame in the very first century. And then Jesus, the carpenter, the con young construction worker, had iron nails six inches long driven into some of the most sensitive nerve centers in the human body. None of this was done in private. Crowds would have gathered to gawk and mock and hurl insults of their own, despite many depictions of uh, the cross in modern day art. It's commonly believed that the victims were crucified at eye level so that the sufferer would be forced to make eye contact with the crowds who came just to insult them in their final moments. And over the hours that Jesus hung on the cross, we would have all reached the same conclusion. This is a mess. No one would have said, what a great day. No one could have written the script that said, what a good Friday this is. No one would have been able to imagine that millennia would have gone by, not just a day, not just a week, not just a month or a year or even a decade, but literally thousands of years would go by. The world would have changed. Everything would look different, but yet somehow, in some way, some people would gather in South Orange County on a night like this. That we would gather for the purpose of Good Friday, let alone that anyone would be saying, oh, this day's not only good, 
This day's not just Good Friday. This is the best of Fridays. This is the most amazing thing humanity has ever seen. Because while the cross looks like a failure, it's actually the greatest act of faithfulness, which has led to incalculable fruitfulness. Jesus turned this symbol of terror and intimidation into a symbol of relentless hope and love, all because our God has the power to turn things around. All because God has the ultimate authority over everything in heaven and on earth because God writes the stories of the world and God is writing the story of the world and in that story is the story of Good Friday where he took the darkest and the worst and made them a player in a divine mystery of a sovereign plan of unstoppable grace. Little did they know in that moment on that Friday that what they thought was their will that what they thought was their intent, that what they thought was their plan and their purpose to shut Jesus down, to stop this movement, to bury the Son of God, little did they know in that moment that they were only accessories to the redemption story of God. Little did they know that they nailed love to a cross so that love could bleed for you and me. That day they thought they would kill Jesus. But what they didn't know is the day that they killed Jesus, that his death was not the end, it was just the beginning. Because after just three days, Jesus would rise again on a day that we call Easter, holding in his hand every key to every lock of every prison, to every darkness, to every bondage, to every addiction, every hopelessness, every pit, every hole, every wound, and every scar. And Jesus would say, I am the living one. I am the alpha and the omega. I am the beginning and the end. And I have the keys to death and hell. I have been there and back. I have suffered, but I am alive. I was humiliated in the darkness, but I will be exonerated in the light. I've got the keys to every single lock, every prison door. And Jesus is in this place on Good Friday saying, consider my wounds. Consider my scars. I'm alive and victorious in this place on this Friday. The prophet Isaiah long ago, over 700 years before Jesus was crucified, wrote about Jesus. And this is what he said that we are remembering tonight in Isaiah chapter 53, verse four. But he, but Jesus, was pierced for our transgressions. So we can all settle in on this tonight that the very heart of tonight is right here. It's not just that Jesus died. I would venture to say that many of us, if not all of us, in some way agree that there was a man named Jesus and that he would die a death. And that symbol of the cross was so powerful from that day forward that it has endured to this day In our day today, what was happening there at the cross? What was the story that was unfolding on that day? What does it mean to you today? What does it mean for me in my life right now in this moment? You may be a businessman in the city. Maybe you're a college student trying to figure out what direction you want to go in your life. Maybe you're a single mom who's been abandoned by a husband, just trying to make a pathway for your kids. Maybe you're a teenager wondering what to make of this world. Maybe you're a skeptic wondering if there even is a God in this world. What does it mean to you that Jesus died on a cross? Long before we even ask the question, Isaiah answers the question as we continue in Isaiah 53, but he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Upon Jesus was the chastisement that brought us peace. What kind of peace? Peace with God. What kind of peace did Jesus bring? A peace that, a peace with this gnawing sense of guilt deep down within our hearts. A peace with people around us in a broken world. It says, as Isaiah continues on, that the punishment that brought us peace was on Jesus. Upon him was the chastisement that brought us peace, and with his wounds, we are healed. 
So it's not that something just happened long ago. It's that the effect of what happened long ago is reverberating all throughout this place today. By his wounds, we are healed. By his wounds, you are healed. I am healed. It's not just that Jesus died for the world because God so loved the whole world. It's that Jesus died so that you and I could be loved by the God who put him there. That you could know in your heart the full effect of what Jesus did on that day when he died. It's so that the volume of sin, so that the far-reaching effects of brokenness would be once and forever defeated on the cross. See, God doesn't love us because Jesus died for us. No, Jesus died for us because God loves us. And so when you fast forward from the book of Isaiah, when you rewind from the story of our life where we're at today in this moment, back to the Apostle Paul, one of the writers of much of the New Testament, a a follower of Jesus, someone who once hated Jesus but was radically rescued and redeemed by God, who later became a champion messenger of the gospel. This is what Paul says as he's writing to a church in Galatia. In Galatians 2, verse 20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. In the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and who gave himself for me. He says, I've been crucified with Christ. Paul is in this moment identifying with what happened to Jesus, but Paul is doing what God invites you and I to do on a regular basis. Paul is identifying himself with everything that Christ did on that day. There's no separation of space and time. Paul's not saying, well, yeah, I know God did something uh, at some point in history on Calvary, but I don't really know what it has to do with my life. I don't know where I'm uh, fitting into this story. No, no, Paul is saying in this moment to this church, I am very much joined together. I have been crucified with Christ, which means when Christ was crucified, I was a part of that story. When God did what he did on that day, I was a part of that story. I, joined, I was joined into the work of God on that day and now consider myself is a follower of Jesus to have been crucified with Christ. What does that even mean? While we weren't on the cross, we were in the story. We couldn't have paid the price, but we are beneficiaries in this reward, which means every single drop of blood that Christ shed and the mercy that flowed there at Calvary. The grace that was extended there from the cross, the kindness that was on display in that moment in history, we are the beneficiaries of it today in our history. I've been crucified together with Christ. Now I'm in that story. Can you say that tonight? Can you say that everything that happened there I'm a beneficiary of that. Everything got affected there and it has changed my life here and transformed my story today. Paul said, I'm in it. I don't just know about it, but I'm in it. I don't just believe in it, it's it's affected me. I'm joined to the story of what Jesus has done. And then Paul goes on in the very next verse to make this unbelievable statement about what this means for him. I've no longer, I've been crucified with Christ, it's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And he goes on in verse 21 to say, I don't nullify the grace of God. For if righteous, if righteousness were through the law, then Christ died for no purpose. Context here, there, this was a letter that was written to believers not too long after the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus. These were very religious people who Paul was talking to who had gone through the motions of a religious process all their lives. And now Jesus and Paul are both coming to say, you don't need religion anymore. You don't need a system anymore. You don't need good works anymore. You don't need an outward sign anymore in your life. You just need faith in Jesus because he finished it all on the cross. And all of these religious people who were 
hearing this letter, this word from Paul, we're hearing now that the story of Jesus, that uh, they, they love Jesus, they love the story of the cross, but somehow they wanted to join the old system and the new grace together into one. They were saying, you know what, we believe in Jesus, but there's still some things you have to do in order to be acceptable to God. And Paul was saying, no, no, no. It is all by grace through faith. When Jesus said it is finished, he didn't mean dot, 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 and then you can just add to it whatever you think you need to add to his sacrifice on the cross. Whatever good works you think you need to do. No, this is the innocent for the guilty. This is the son of God for the sins of the world. This is paid in full. It is done. It is God's work. It's the end of the system and the beginning of a savior. Paul says, I'm not gonna go, I'm not gonna go back to anything in the past because I've seen what Jesus has done for the future. So he says, I don't nullify, and nullify, this means to just set aside, to cancel out, to rob of power. I'm not gonna set aside the final and finished, complete work of Jesus on the cross. And on the surface, you and I would say, yeah, yeah, Paul, me too. I mean, that, I'm for that. I want that. I wasn't even there at Calvary. I, I couldn't stop what was happening to Jesus in that moment. I wasn't even in the picture. Yes, I was on God's heart, but nobody at that point in history knew about Brandon. And so, yeah, of course not. I'm not, I'm not going to nullify. How could I nullify that? How could I render powerless what Christ has done? We don't have the ability to go back and undo what God did at Calvary but we do have the opportunity to ignore it. And Paul said, for me, I'm not gonna set aside, I won't nullify what God has done. How do we even nullify what God has done? Well, there are a few ways. Uh, some ways that I believe that you and I today, a couple of thousand years later, could nullify the work of God in our life. First way is this, we nullify the grace of God when we walk right past it and we ignore it. Do you know that when Jesus was crucified, when he died, there were two other people in the story. There was a thief on the right and a convicted criminal on the left. One of the criminals antagonized Jesus, taunted him. He, he piled on with all of the rulers who were doing the same. He piled on with all of the Romans who were taunting and antagonizing Jesus. He, he piled on with all of the other crucifiers, with all of the crowd who was just doing the same. And in the very last breath, that this convicted criminal had, dying five feet from the savior of the world, he used this moment to hurl insults at Jesus. And for all of eternity, this convicted criminal knows, I was right there. Yeah, I blew it. My life was a wreck. I got hauled before the authorities. I got convicted of what I've done. I got sentenced by those with power and I was crucified on a cross next to the savior of the world. I was at the end of my life in the tragedy of a life and yet God still loved me enough to put me right next to Jesus when I was dying and I just nullified the grace of God by choosing to ignore it when it was right in front of me. How tragic tonight that any person would come to a beautiful night like tonight and see the story of grace lifted up like it has been tonight and just walk away and move on to the very next thing that you have on your schedule. I was right there. God got me into that building called Mountain View Church. Maybe you don't know how you got here. Maybe you feel like you don't belong here because you're not a church person or you feel like you're not even a good person. Isn't it amazing that God would love you enough, he would care about you enough to say, we're gonna, we're gonna celebrate the greatest story of all tonight, you should come. Isn't it amazing that God would say, we're gonna celebrate a God who finds us where we are and loves us like we are, you, you should come. We're gonna celebrate the savior who can put broken things back together, you should come, but yet we nullify it. We nullify the grace of God when, when it's right in front of us and we just choose to ignore it. Another way that we nullify the grace of God is when we, when we try to add to it. Hey, Jesus, thanks for all that you've done. I'll take it from here. 
Jesus, I appreciate you getting me this far in my relationship with our heavenly father. I think I can do it from here. But the cross reminds us that Jesus did his part and my part. The grace of God and the beauty of grace is that when you couldn't do your part, Jesus did. Uh, But I'll try to go back and fix what I've messed up. What we're saying in this moment is that we're nullifying the grace of God. I'm gonna set aside what Jesus did because I feel bad about what I've done. We nullify the grace of God when we ignore it, when we try to add to it. And we nullify the grace of God when we try to undo it. Did you know that the hammer that crucified Jesus was more like a mallet than it was a hammer like our day? You know, you you may have a hammer at home even if it's uh, tucked away and you've never used it. A modern hammer looks a lot like this with the hammer on one side and the claw on the other. You know why there's this claw on the other side? It's for all of us wannabe carpenters. It's for all of us who get an idea from Pinterest from our wives and we're like, you know what, I'm gonna save the money on that and do it myself. Uh, This claw is there for those of us who've hammered our fingers more than we've hammered nails. This claw is there for those of us who've uh, hammered the door frame instead of the nail or we hit the nail and It doesn't drive into the wood, it goes sideways and just kind of bends over instead of doing what you needed it to do. Uh, This claw is in there for all of us who choose the wrong size nail and it goes all the way through the said project that you're working on. For most of us, not the expert builders and contractors, we, we use the claw a whole lot more on the hammer. But in the gospel, at the cross, there is no claw. But we're determined in our day today, right now on this Good Friday, we are so determined to try to pry out the nails and say, you know what, I I know God hammered them in, but I'm just gonna claw them out. I'm just gonna carry this shame. I'm just gonna live with this guilt. I'm just gonna carry this stigma and carry this this condemnation. But do you know what? I can't imagine that God truly meant what he said, that it is done and finished in my life. Maybe it's because we don't wanna be associated with people who call themselves Christians because there's too much hypocrisy there and so we, we try to claw out the nail that took Jesus to the cross. Maybe, maybe it's because of what you, you fear in the back of your mind or that's stuck in your heart that what will other people say if I, if I give my life to Christ what are other people gonna say? Maybe it's because we've got so much information in our day to day that we can YouTube any story that we wanna know about and know about it instantly and then have AI to tell us exactly how we can leverage this information. Maybe it's just because you don't know how to live free in the reality that Jesus has set us free. I only know how to live bound and so I gotta pull out some of these nails. If you don't mind, I'll just, I'll just pull out some of the grace and pull back some of the grace that God has given. I'm gonna undo some of the righteousness that God has transferred into my personal account. And when we do, we nullify the grace of God. I just want you to know tonight, it would honor God if you put down the claw and you picked up the hammer. And in your mind, and in your heart, and in your life, you just started to pound away. In such a way that you so resonate with the Apostle Paul when he says in Colossians chapter two, that Jesus has forgiven us all our trespasses by canceling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This Jesus set aside, there's that same word, set aside. This Jesus nullified, hello, in our life. This Jesus pushed off to the side, nailing it to the cross. And there are no claws, there are no undos in what Jesus has done. 
What if tonight, what if tonight you said, yeah, I'm not gonna carry this guilt anymore. I'm not gonna be marked by condemnation. My name will not be called shame and I will not live under the stigma of failure. I will actually walk in the freedom of a savior. And I'm gonna leave on the cross what God has put there. And what Jesus has done is now finished for me. Father, we are, we are absolutely blown away by the love, the compassion, the grace, the kindness that you would choose to pursue the most excruciating death humanly possible. That, that you would not just subject yourself, but put up no objection. That you would do this, that you would be crucified because of your deep love for us. God, may we not ignore it. May we not try to undo it. May we not try to add anything to it. And God, help us to never forget it. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.